Welcome to Yahoo Finance Uncut. I am your host, Jared Blickery. And today joining me is Eve Bobak. She is a portfolio manager over at Ropil Capital Management and also Kathy Donnelly. She is a proprietary trader. Both of them, I should add, are co-authors of a book called The Life Cycle Trade. And we're going to be talking about that. It is a book to help you trade IPOs and high growth stocks. We haven't seen a lot of IPOs this year, but we're trying to find some basis uh, to trade off of. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, Let's talk to uh, Kathy and Eve here about what's been happening in the market. And Kathy, I'll go to you first. We've done a couple webinars specifically uh, talking about IPO trading and also these high growth stocks, uh, which have fallen out of fashion uh, recently. I'm just wondering how you're viewing the current market environment, and then I'll throw it to you, Eve. Okay. Yeah, I definitely am not happy with this market. Uh, you know, I wish it was better so I could be, you know, looking for those uh, strong, super gross stocks and, and, and make some money. Uh, but it just hasn't been in the cards. So I'm playing the, you know, patience is a virtue game. And as we'll probably talk about later, the sweet spot for me, based on our research, is that uh, the phase of the IPO where it goes from the institutional due diligence phase to the institutional advance phase. So I'm still very active in the market, looking at those stock lists every week of those recent IPOs last three years, and just keeping my eye out because when that first mature base forms, I want to be there. Yes, that's right. When, not if. And now, Eve, I'll give you the floor. Yes, definitely opportunities down the road. I'm using this time as the time for research and screening. If you look at the Renaissance IPO ETF, it's around 50, a little bit more than 50% off um, year to date. And also, if you look at growth stocks, um, they're off considerably as well. So we've been in a bear market for a long time. Uh, they typically say either scares you out or wears you out. This <laughs> one's definitely trying to wear people out. Um, one thing we mentioned in our book as well is IPOs are risk on type of assets and uh, really the time to trade those is in a, a strong bull market in an uptrend when the account is doing well. Certainly we don't have that environment right now, um, but we never know when the time will turn. So we always need to be prepared. So that's why I'm screening and researching now. And we are preparing right now. Preparation underway. Kathy, you mentioned a couple terms that are proprietary to your method of analysis in your book. I just like you to go through them right now because this also applies to some of those higher growth names that we're looking out to potentially invest in and trade in the future. Yeah, well, what we coined in the uh, life cycle trade, the terminology that you're speaking of, is the uh, pretty much the life cycle uh, phases. So there's three essentially main phases. There's the IPO advance phase. So an IPO comes to market, it maybe builds a short base and it either goes up or down. And if it goes up, we call that the advance phase. And if it goes down, then it's an advanced failure. And then as most people will probably have observed with IPOs, Nothing really happens after that. It fails, it goes sideways, it might go down really low, under, undercut its day one low, undercut the base that it may have created. And that could go on for 40 weeks or longer, maybe even up to five years. But at some point, institutions are looking at those stocks and they're trying to determine if this is something I actually do want to invest in in the long haul. And that period of time is called the institutional due diligence phase. So that's really the, I guess, the long phase of the IPO. And it, like I said, 40 weeks to five years or more. But then at some point, the institutions are saying, no, actually, I do like this stock. And this is going to be the one that I want to invest in for the long haul. It'll form a first mature base. And then that's where we're looking for the transition into the institutional advance phase. And that can be one of the most rewarding phases of the IPO soon after, you know, zero to five years potentially, but you could make 100 to 200% or more, uh, depending on how strong that company is and how they're uh, really changing the way we live, work and play. And Eve, just your thoughts on uh, some of the, applying what uh, you and, and Kathy found and your other co-author found in the book, to the current market environment. We were just chatting beforehand. Now, a word to our viewers. This is a taped uh, conversation here, happened within the last couple of weeks, but we recently fell out of bed. We see the stock market, that is the overall market, whether it's S&P, Dow, NASDAQ, all making new relative lows for the year. And I'm just wondering how this is fitting, how your research fits into the current market environment. 
Well, it's um, very important. The phases that Kathy mentioned, the institutional due diligence phase, those are actually happening right now. And we'll see accumulations start to pop up on the names that institutions have researched and are trying to start uh, nibbling on getting positions. So I'm going to watch for the technical action and look for that first mature base. We talk about that um, a little bit more in our book and show the different phases. That first mature base typically occurs around a year, year and a half in, and it's going to come in probably around the 40 week moving average. So I'm watching for that type of action, technical action. I'm really taking the cues from the uh, leading stocks as well. So one screen that I take a look at and um, we talk a little bit about some of the screening um, in our book as well, but looking at the strength off the bottom. So, you know, recently the market I mean, I'm not saying it was the bottom, but uh, it kind of bottomed out at June 16th and then started a little bit of a run move up. So what I'm always watching is which names are the most powerful there and uh, which names are potentially setting up that first mature base after an institutional due diligence phase. Because like Kathy mentioned, though, that will be um, the, the probably most profitable phase if they can make it out of that that particular phase and start the institutional advanced phase. And Eve, any sectors, styles, individual names that you can mention here today that have recently popped up on your radar that you're at least looking at? Oh, you know, I should mention too, um, this is purely for educational purposes and sure. anything that we talk about like individual securities, they're not trade or investment recommendations. It's just for illustrative purposes. But it's hard to find, Jared, in this market. I'll tell yes. you, I ran some screens ahead of our uh, our session today, and uh, it was quite surprising. So if you look at one screen, it's, uh, it's IPOs over the last several years that are liquid. We always look at liquid IPOs, and what we're talking about there is about $20 million average traded per day. And what I try to do is look for strength. So which IPOs are above their IPO price and then also above their first um, day close? Because we give some surprising statistics in the book. Our research uncovered that quite a few, a majority of um, IPOs actually undercut their first day low in several weeks. I think it's like three weeks. So um, if they could muster up the strength to be above those two points, um, then they're, they're really quite strong in this very weak bear market. But there's only like out of 880 names, there was only a few, like around 18 names that popped up. And to be honest, all of most of them are just getting crushed. They're down, you know, 70, 80 percent at this point. So if anything, I'm just building watch lists. The other list that I'm building is those names that have been strong off that June kind of low that was set recently, though. Looks like we're trying to undercut it soon. Um, but which names have actually powered up and held some of those gains? You know, so names like one of the names that popped up was Snowflake. Now, while it's damaged off the top in terms of the correction, it's one that moved up from that June point and um, has held some of those gains. I mean, to me, it's just something to put on the watch list. So that's that's one example of a name that pops up. It has you know, revenue growth, um, and it's worth watching. It's going through an institutional due diligence phase. No one knows if they'll move out of there, um, but it's a name that's showing some power on the screens and one worth uh, keeping an eye on. So I, I threw that on my watch list after I ran the screen. So that's just one example. I don't know if any popped up for you, Kath. Yeah, let's go to you, Kath. Yeah, well, um... Rivian actually uh, is an example of one that had a huge decline after uh, its IPO, but it also has risen off the bottom. And I should also disclose that that is an example of a stock that I do have a 1% of my portfolio. So 1%, not a lot of money in right now that I have been holding. And of course, it's been correcting with the rest of the market. So if it, if it continues, if it's not able to hold, I'll have to cut it right away. 
Um, but it's, it seems to be holding up. And so what I'm hoping is that even if the market does create this uh, another leg down or whatever it's going to end up doing, that if this one can hold, then that could be the potential of that first mature base here at the bottom, or at least if it goes sideways and still holds the levels it's been holding, that could be one that I would add more to, uh, again, if it uh, continues to, to build a little bit of a base. But like Snow, like Eve said, it also has come off the bottom, is kind of starting to go sideways. So we'll see. And I, I like the story of Rivian, you know, the electric truck, you know, uh, I have some friends that you know, that's all they're from Texas and they like their trucks and they're like, well, you know, Rivian is one of the ones that I'm looking into. And I've seen a few and I've seen actually a few more keep popping up. So it's one of those things where you see them around. You're like, you know, kind of like when you saw the first Tesla and then you started seeing more Teslas. So we'll see what happens. But but that's one I'm keeping my eye on. And I've got a little bit of money at stake, but again, not a lot. So we'll see. Kathy and I didn't even plan this. I also have <laughs> a, a very small pilot position in Rivian. And that was because the market sh exhibited strength in um, June and July. And so what I do in that type of a market is I'm testing very small buys. So, um, and as Kathy mentioned, in this kind of environment, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't get stopped out, um, but it's it's a name that's, uh, that's interesting and I do have a pilot position in them. Well, Eve, key word there, stopped out. Let's talk about risk management for a second uh, for a second here. It's um very much necessary. It's also something that is not always forefront in the in the minds of new investors, sometimes even older investors here. How do you approach trades when you're when you some people will allocate a certain amount of money to the trade? They'll put in stop losses, stop losses, they have a written plan, maybe they don't. Taking notes, what do you do to uh ensure that you're at least abiding by a process when you're taking on a new name? Great question, Jared. It's such an important topic. It's it's the place that I always start. I always have a plan for the week, and I put that together when the market is closed over the weekend. And uh, we call that our ride the wave plan because uh, we're trading trends, um, we're um, position traders, and we're looking for the, you know, the next the next Amazon, the next Tesla. And so um, what we're doing, what I'm doing is on the weekend, I'm planning um, for what each stop is for each of the positions that I have. If I've held it for a long time, um, then it's more of a hold rule. So I'm going to hold this name until this happens. And that's always planned out. So it takes the emotion out of the equation as much as possible. Um, when, you know, you're in the battle of the market, which is a, definitely a battle lately, the bear market. Um, so that's, that's a very important point that you bring up the risk management. And what we do, um, is also have, um, obviously stop sets on all of our positions. And, uh, what I'm doing is typically taking, um, a, in a strong bull market, you know, position size, maybe I would say eight, 10% might be a little bit more for a high conviction name. Um, if I'm wrong on the timing or, or the name, I'm going to be stopping out of that position in, in lots and typically in the 3% range down 3%, I'm going to take some of that position off down 4%. I'm going to take more of that position off. And typically when it's down 5%, if it's a, if it's a full position, that's out the door. My timing was wrong or I was wrong on the name. So I'm trying to keep my, my losses very small when I'm wrong. And then I'm trying to let my winners run. And so over time, I can be wrong actually quite a few times because I'm keeping the, the losses very small when I'm wrong. And so like small wins and small losses kind of wash each other out. Um, but if I select a few of, of the big winners, those are the ones that contribute most to the portfolio. Well, kind of the name of the game there. Hey, Kathy, I would imagine your risk management uh, is somewhat similar, having uh, shared the book writing experience there, and also being a professional trader, proprietary as you are. The I, I What I want the readers to, or not the readers, if you're reading an article about this, sure, what I want the viewers to come away with is that there's a lot, there's a lot of thinking that goes into trading. And uh, the armchair retail investor, I think oftentimes doesn't necessarily focus on that, uh, but it is in fact how 
professionals consistently win. And so what's what's your approach when you're thinking about a trade? Uh, what are you writing down for your in terms of your notes so that you can refer back to it? Uh, what goes into that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I learned uh, a long time ago, I guess it was maybe 2004, 2005, I read the book, How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill. And that's actually what how I met Eve and my co-authors. I went to a, a local IBD meetup, and that's how we initially met. And they were presenters, and um, I used to watch them present, and I wanted to be like them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I got into the fold there. And what Bill O'Neill teaches in his book is that all the number one golden rule is cut all losses at seven to eight percent of your buy point. So I learned early on that that was the number one rule that I had to make sure I cut up my losses quickly so that I always had capital to try again. And so I still do that today. Uh, when we did the research, we did test 10% uh, for IPOs, a 10% stop loss, because just due to the nature of the volatility of IPOs. And I would say for the most part, that is still the rule that I follow today. Uh, I mean, if it's an obvious reversal, the market's down and I just, you know, you just feel it that, okay, I gotta just cut this now. Uh, but usually I'm a seven to eight percent and that has worked well for me. So I cut all my losses at seven to eight percent. My goal is to hit a home run at hundred percent or more. And I'm just very fortunate that I learned that from William O'Neill because surely in the very beginning, even though he was teaching me that, I was at times even taking losses more than that. And it, that actually was a lesson I had to learn and actually learn by experience that yes, Bill O'Neill is right. We have to cut our losses quickly. We can always buy it back. And that is the best way, I think, because like you said, Jared, a lot of people do not learn how to sell. We make all this money. And then the big question is, when do I sell? When do I sell? So you actually need sell rules even when you have your gains and how much you're willing to give back in addition to when you first make the purchase of the stock and it doesn't work that you're getting out quickly so that you can try again on another name. Yeah, I've noticed over the years that uh, a lot of new investors have one common rule that they adhere to no matter what, which is if you get caught in a losing position or losing a substantial amount of money, uh, you hold that stock until you're one penny in the green and then you sell it, which is actually a terrible <laughs> strategy. But nevertheless, I've seen that play out. And hey, I might have done it uh, once or twice myself. Um, but we're talking about Bill O'Neill here. And Eve, I was actually just digging through some materials. Yes, I do a little bit of research here. You are actually in a book, uh, How to Make Money from Stocks, success stories. And so this is about people who have used the IBD method over the years. And uh, I have uh, this paragraph in here. You actually met Bill, and this goes back yes. into the mid 90s. And he signed your book, How to Make Money in Stocks. Do you remember what he inscribed it with? Oh, yes. He said, um, buy the best companies with um, great earnings, um, breaking out of bases, moving out of That's bases. It. That's and it. And it, it really says so much in that one sentence. And that was when I was newer starting out at first. And I was uh, brave enough to go up there after he presented at the seminar and introduce myself. And that was how I started um, to get to know Bill. And I was, I'm very lucky because Bill O'Neill has been a mentor to me over the years. I've been very lucky. I've had some great mentors that have helped me, great traders and investors that have shared their experience with me. And it's so valuable. And, and that's one of the reasons, too, when we conducted all this research on IPOs, you know, we found it helpful and uh, we wanted to share it with others in case it's helpful to others because uh, so many of our mentors have done that. Yeah. Well, could you great working with um, being able to talk to Bill and learn from Bill? It's been a great experience. And Eve, I'll get to you in a, in a second, Kathy. I just you can you drop some names here? We we love that here on Yahoo Finance. So you just just say some names who you had a, you came into contact with over the years, um, sure. or who influenced you, and they don't have to be big names, uh, just sure. influencers in your realm. Yeah. So uh, in terms of mentors, uh, Bill O'Neill, Jim Ropel, who is the founder of Ropel Capital Management, uh, Peter Brandt, uh, who's a commodities trader. And um, I've met uh, Jack Schwager and his work has influenced me quite a bit. Uh, Dan Zanger, um, I know Dan Zanger and he's, he was giving us input and feedback on the book. 
um, and uh, he's shared his experiences with us in seminars, and, and he's been an influence on me. And then um, Dr. Brett Steenbarger, from a trading psychology perspective, um, has uh, has helped so much, and um, he's also has written a, a piece in our book. And um, there's so many other people <laughs> that uh, that have helped. I mean, in terms of a network of colleagues, it's it's so important in this business because it can be a little bit isolating trading and investing. Oh yes. And uh, so what we have is this great group of uh, portfolio managers and traders that we talk to on a regular basis, and we challenge each other. And, um, you know, if I try to list all of them, they know who they are. <laughs> I'm sure I'll leave someone out. And, and of course, from our co-authors, um, I've learned so much, you know, from Kathy, from Eric Kroll, who isn't here, and, and Kurt Dale as well. So um, it's been, um, it's just great that everyone shares their experiences. And, um, you know, I try to do the same as well. This is one of the things I like about the the trading community, and I'm talking about more geared towards the retail element. Um, not that Bill O'Neill is not institutional, but a lot of the books are are geared towards the average retail trader, um, and that's what we focus on. And Kathy, I know that you just did a podcast or show with uh, Arusha Paris and also Justin Nielsen. I'm actually taping something with them uh, in the near oh. future. Uh, so we we like IVD over here. What's what's been some of your experience? How'd you come into contact with um, IVD, Eve? How'd you how'd you get into contact with the group that wrote the book too? Well, like I mentioned, uh, well, so I moved from Texas to Illinois, and I didn't know anybody, and I had already purchased Bill O'Neill's book as well as some other investing books. I just hadn't read it yet, and when I got into Illinois and I didn't know anybody, I was like, well, I might as well start reading this book, you know, Bill O'Neill's book, How to Make Money in Stocks. And immediately, you know, he talks about the IVD meetup and luckily there just happened to be one where I had moved to. So I was like, great, I'll go. And Eric Kroll and Kurt Dale, our co couple of co-authors, along with the, another person, uh, they were uh, organizing the meetup. And then Eve was also an attendee and would present from time to time. And so, you know, I was like this little kid you know, I was adult, but I was like, I felt like this little kid just trying to learn from Eric and Kurt. And then Eve would present, and of course, seeing Eve, a woman investor being successful, like I really wanted to be her friend. <laughs> so, you know, Eve and I joke around, you know, because uh, she did a presentation once and I had like my old notepad and I was asking her a question and I'm like, oh, maybe I should ask her to lunch. <laughs> maybe she'll go to lunch with me. <laughs> And uh, she did. And so we went to lunch together and then, you know, got to know each other. And that's how we became such good friends. And and, we're, and in a way, you know, we're kind of groupies because we used to go to all the level fours at uh, Investor Business <laughs> Daily. And like we literally would go to every one. They used to have it twice a year. And when I say level four, they had a master class. Unfortunately, they don't offer it anymore. But they used to offer it twice a year with Bill O'Neill. And then they went to one year. And even I would go to all of them. And everyone would just know, here come Eve and Kathy, because <laughs> we, we would go to all of them. So, um, yeah, we were kind of, you know, Bill O'Neill's groupies. And then we did also see go to see Dan Zanger together. And um, so anyway, I'm just so grateful that I ended up moving to Illinois, ended up finally reading Bill's book, meeting them. And then, yeah, the evolution of the book came years later, but we had built this solid relationship. And like you said, you know, just a network of just talking about stocks and trying to learn from each other. Yeah, now we're sisters. Yeah, oh, now we're sisters. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's great. I wanted to follow up on that, Eve, because you're talking about the isolation of being a trader, and especially over the pandemic, I think a lot of people yeah. have felt that in spades. But IBD has these meetups, we have Twitter, we have all kinds of tools, but there's also a lot of junk out there, uh, just to put yeah. it mildly, to mm -hmm. put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. um, how do you sift through the noise and how do you find some sense of um, community or belonging in an otherwise somewhat lonely profession? Well, we do have regular calls and projects that we work together on. Um, we also have, there's a group of us that have a, a text thread and we share information, you know, at key points. Um, if any of us conduct research, you know, sometimes we ask each other to, to take a look at the research. We may present it to each other and then get feedback. Um, a lot of that, of course, during COVID was done uh, via Zoom, but I'm happy that a few of things lately are more in person because you really 
miss something. I mean, there's a lot to be said for the online experience because you can get a wider audience together on short notice from different locations. But there is that um, human contact, you know, that in-person element that you miss some of the sidebar conversations or people that you can meet. So I'm glad that they're resuming some of the in-person events. Like Kathy said, we would attend these um, in-person events, you know, sometimes once, twice, even more a year. And uh, that's actually the way I met Eric Kroll. So I, I don't know if Eric remembers this, but it was we were out in California and um, we were having breakfast and the seat next to him was empty. And I go, is anyone sitting here? And, and that's how <laughs> he ended up asking where I was from. And uh, did you know who he, he was at the time? No, I didn't know oh, okay. who he was. And he was just very gracious and, and invited me to his um, meetup. He and a few other people had a, a meetup in Naperville. And it just so happened to be that it was close to me. I'm in the Chicago area. And uh, so he invited me. And that's how I started to, to meet all the other people and, and Kathy eventually and Kurt as well. Yeah. <laughs> And Kathy, you brought up, um, you mentioned this, you kind of touched on it a second, ago, a second ago, and it's something that we've talked about in our webinars, as well as Yahoo Finance live shows, and that is women in trading. And, um, you know, males, females, there are differences, we got shades in between, but I want to talk about some of the specific attributes that maybe uh, you have benefited from. And what I've noticed over the years is that female traders tend not to be caught up in the swinging for the fences all the time. That gets a lot of guys, gets them into drawdowns, wipes out accounts. Not that females or anybody is immune from this, but um, less risk taking can be a little bit of a better thing. Keeping your head down, keeping towards a plan seems to be the domain of uh, females in trading. And that can help, especially retail traders. And just speak to me, if you can, uh, what it's like uh, being a female proprietary trader here. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Jared, I don't know if you remember, uh, well, actually, was it my very first Yahoo appearance uh, was um, I talked about women investors. Yes, I remember the, that now. Yeah, yeah. And so I did the research and actually Fidelity did the research. Fidelity and Barclays have both done studies where women actually their brains are wired for investing. And in the long term, they've seen that women actually outperform uh, men by, I think, maybe a percent or two, I don't, something like that. And it's just the way that we're wired. So I think you're exactly right. And on Twitter, You'll see people say like these guys will tweet and they'll be like, yeah, my wife, she's doing so much better than me. And 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 that and it, it speaks to me perfectly because what it is, is we're more actually a long term holder. And that is what they showed in the research is that women will hold on longer. So, yeah, we don't necessarily get sucked into the dips. And, and that's me to a T. You know, I want to buy at that first mature base around the 40 week line. And we we're talking about earlier during that transition of the phases. And then I just want to hold on. And so long term, I'm accumulating and uh, compounding all those games. So I always tell my friends that are women like, well, you know, we're wired for it. So if you're interested, <laughs> definitely give it a shot. And of course, I'm happy to help uh, anyone that that's that's willing to do so. So corollary being there's no excuse. You got to try this. Um, <laughs> no, oh, no, not... Jared, let me mention ahead, another you. thing about yeah. uh, sorting through the noise because I, I forgot to mention it. Sure. I'm a member of the FinTwit community. So in Twitter, there are groups that share information regarding um, stocks and investing. And I really want to give a shout out to Richard Moglin and the Trader Lion group because Richard has gone out and interviewed a lot of very experienced traders. And he's done that over a long period of time and he shares these on his podcast. And he's interviewed traders that are very successful. Some of them are investing champions. And I try to listen to them whenever whenever I can because you know he's interviewed some of the greats as well. And um and it's they're just sharing. They're sharing their knowledge. And so one of the things that's uh, available now in the in the world that was not available when I first started trading is you can get if you really dig and want to learn how to trade and you're starting out from kind of like zero there's there are a lot of resources but like you said I uh, really need to sift through and make sure that yes. they're from sources that uh, you know have had the experience and are sharing their experience and, and are successful in their fields 
And how about you, Kathy? Any online resources or offline resources that you want to share here? This would be a good time to put some shout outs into the uh, universe. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely second uh, what Eve said about what Richard Moglin has done and the Trader Lion team. I'm actually, he's actually interviewed me New Year's Eve, maybe uh, two years ago. So if anyone wants to look that up. <laughs> How did that cr conversation go? I mean, people are toasting <laughs> champagne, waiting for the content. You're talking shop, all right, on New Year's Eve. That's impressive yeah. in and of itself. But I interrupted you. You, you have oh yeah no worries but yeah it was it was a fun one um and it was fun because yeah it was the end of the year starting the new year but uh and of course you already mentioned investors business daily um and their podcast i mean i listen to that every week um and you know to be honest from the beginning of when i started on this journey once i got hooked in with investors business daily i mean they've been my one-stop shop um, so I, I, I go to them for all their resources. I'm still a subscriber to, to market Smith and investors business daily. Um, so, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there's a lot of resources out there, so it can mm -hmm. almost be overwhelming. Yeah. So in terms if, of great resources. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's so many great resources. And the thing is, is, you know, you could break down the system, even the IBD can, you know, Bill O'Neill can some system, and you can apply it in so many different ways. You know, maybe you like the way Stan Weinstein talks about it. You know, he talks about stages, or maybe you talk about, uh, you like the way Mark Minervini talks about it, where he talks about volatility contraption pattern. And I may not have said that exactly right. Sounds about right. Yeah, VCP, let's just call it VCP for short. So, but at the end of the day, it's kind of the same thing. It's just like, how are you gonna approach it and what works best for you and how your brain works? So, you know, I guess what I would say to everyone out there is, you know, try one for a while and see if that works for you. And if it doesn't work, you know, don't get frustrated. There's another way to look at it um, because there's just so many resources. And you try to apply every single one to the one, you know, to the one base or stock, you could end up confusing yourself and then not being successful. So that's what I would just caution people to be aware of. Because There's so many different ways to look at something because it is an art. You yes. know, looking at the stocks and looking at the patterns, you know, you might see a double bottom. I see a cup with handle. I mean, you know, there's so many different ways uh, to look at it. Well, and it is there is a lot of subjectivity there. Eve, I want to I want to pass it over to you. Um, you, you we were talking about risk management before. You had some yeah. very very specific criteria, but I'm wondering when you were getting into the business, how did you educate? How did you educate yourself, and how would you, um, I guess, give advice to newcomers in terms of all the resources that are available now? Great question. And um, in terms of risk management. I read a lot of different books on investing, on trading. I attended a lot of seminars, um, and and then I um, had a great network of mentors, and um, really developed my process from all of those resources. Uh, my education is in finance, so I I did go uh, for my MBA. Uh, in finance. Um, so that's kind of my background, but really digging in. Um, and we list like in our appendix, in our book, some of uh, my favorite books. Um, we kind of collectively have a list of great resources that we've found. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is Peter Lynch and his book, uh, One Up on Wall Street, had a great influence on me um, as well in terms of just um, knowing, you know, knowing what you own. Um, and also in how you get research ideas and, and how you get stock ideas. So that's one of the books that's listed there, but we have a lot of the classics. Um, John Boyk's uh, books are listed there, you know, How Legendary Traders Made Millions um, and some of his other books. And, and really just absorbing a lot of information. One of the things I want to mention about risk management also is there's probably too much focus, in my opinion, on win rates. Um, you know, mm -hmm. In terms of that, it has to be very high. Uh, it depends on the system. So, you know, I can be wrong more than I'm right as long as I'm cutting losses. Um, it's very important to understand uh, the math associated with trading. 
um, because you can have a string of losses or you can have a string of wins. Um, and really the math has to be in play there that it's going to work out. And one thing that I focus more on is the, the profit loss ratio. So I want to keep that at least like three to one, if not better. Um, and what I found over time in analyzing my trades and looking back over time, it's usually several stocks that that make a big year for me. And um, that's why it's so important to let the winners run. I mean, they're really important because um, otherwise it's very easy to just wash out profits and losses. And so finding a way to hold on to winners. Um, the way I do that is I trade more around a core. Um, so I'm uh, actually, you know, reducing or adding to a position um, based on technical action. But if it's a, it's a high conviction name, I'm trying to hold the core for a longer period of time. And I may need to hedge it at different periods of time. Um, but I always have the rules in place and I always am monitoring my statistics. And this is very important for a bear market, too. Sure. Um, in terms of the risk management topic, I'm going to trade very differently in an environment as this versus if we were in a raging bull, like in you know April, May, June of 2020, um, and you know at, at the start of a bull. So um, here during a bear market, I'm going to try to do a lot less, like maybe not trade at all. I'm going to let my rules take me out of my position. And so I may just naturally get down to a very, very low exposure level, which that's what has happened because we're in a bear market. So as long as you have rules that say, I'm going to retain this much of profits or I'm going to hold until this happens, or I'm going to stop out if I take a new position, naturally during a bad market, your exposure will go down. The other thing that's, um, that I found is helpful is to have very small position sizes when not trading well. And not trading well could be due to a trader themselves is having some type of issue, or it could be the market environment just doesn't work for that particular set of tactics for trading. And so by trading smaller as kind of win rate goes down, um, you're getting stopped out more often, then I find like I'm trading the smallest, losing less when the market is is bad, and and the other way around. So if you're going into a, a bull market, that's going to be a time to be more aggressive as as my positions start to work. But otherwise, it's very easy to give back a lot of gains um, off the top. So I try to let the positions, my positions, guide me in terms of exposure level. And the other thing from a risk management perspective is I'm not going to make drastic changes either way to exposure. So if I want to, let's say I see bullish action in the market, I see a number of names that I want to take positions in, I'm not going to make huge adjustments in any one point in time. I'm going to do that gradually over time. And that's that's very important because essentially, I believe, Eve, you're saying that uh, you're letting the market and the market behavior determine your position sizing and basically, therefore, your portfolio uh, size as well, in as much as that's affected by your trading. And um, I, I want to flip it to you, Kathy, to get your thoughts on that, the importance of math and rules-based trading, uh, keeping your account, uh, I guess, in the green, providing uh, fodder for a new day here. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I'll I'll give it back to bring or bring up William O'Neill again, you know, where he talks about he does talk about portfolio management uh, in his book and in, in the seminars that he's done. And, you know, he actually was a believer, you know, in concentration versus diversity so that when you're right, you know, you make the most money in what you're right in. So, you know, he was a proponent of, you know, maybe five to 10 stocks you know, at the most at any point in time. Um, and then actually the less money you have, maybe you even have less than that uh, versus, you know, 20 or 50 stocks. Um, and so that's how I've always done my concentration, you know, in a strong market, you know, I'll start with a 16, 8% position size. And then, like I said earlier, because this market's been bad, it's been like a 1% position size because I'm hedging my risk and I don't know if it's going to work, but I still want to try, you know, these things that look like maybe they're building. So then that way, once you're in the stock, you know, you get a little bit more experience and, and feel of, 
you know, you're in the market. And so you're getting all those emotions. And, but you can also, you just like, it's almost like once you're in, it's easier to add and to sell than that first plunge in kind of thing. So even the 1%, I think gives a good feel for the market. Um, but then, you know, if the market uh, goes better, I hope to get to that 18, 20% position. And that's basically just based on what I learned from Bill O'Neill, concentration versus diversification. So that when I get those 100% winners, I mean, I might have two position sizes worth and then plus that compounding so that really in a good year, I maybe it's only one or two stocks that really makes my year. And that's really how I was ended up being successful with Bill's system back in 2009 from 2011. We had you know a good market and I had a lot of money in Apple and Priceline, which is now booking. And so I really was able to experience that concentration and the importance of it to really change your life. And Eve, this is something that I've heard. Normally, I would do a follow up to Kathy because you just talked about this, but I know you have similar backgrounds. Um, Eve, concentration versus diversity. This is something that I think is something that can be practiced and should be practiced by experienced traders. But somebody who's relatively new to the game coming in might just say, "Well, I own ten stocks right now. I'm concentrated, but the diver uh, I'm concentrated, not diversified. So that's fine. But they might be the wrong ten stocks. And so maybe I can just you can help me reiterate how." important it is that all of this was within the context of having a plan, uh, especially right. a written plan and abiding by the rules in it. Yes, so critical. Um, when starting out, one thing that I found is helpful is to just really do the studying and then just tr try, you know, write down all the rules that, that are necessary for the system and then start with a very small amount of money, you know, money that um, you're willing to pay tuition <laughs> to the market with. <laughs> yes, it's true. Because really, that is going to be some of the best education. Like when I was first getting started, you know, occasionally you break the rules. And one and the way you learn, really, the best way to learn is uh, unfortunately, by paying tuition to the market or losing some money and saying, you know, I'm not going to let that happen again. Um, so I have no hesitancy to cut my losses. That's something I, I never hesitate to cut losses because I know how the math works. I know that I could, if I'm wrong at this particular time, the next time I can try again with a particular name that I want to take a position in. Um, so um, really a small amount of money learning the lessons. In terms of um, position size, Position size too aggressive can can blow up an account over time, and um, so it's very important to um, ensure that the positions are they can be concentrated, but they can't be so large that a series of um, incorrectly placed or timed trades could wipe out the account. Um, when you start getting that, you know, typically, if, if something is going to be uh, a 20% position for me, it would be probably growing to that. And then as it starts to get larger, as it starts to work, I'm going to start reducing and selling into strength because I don't want the single stock risk. I still want concentration, but I know that concentration, you know, works both ways. So it's, um, it's used more for very high conviction names. Um, I will press up occasionally when I have a high conviction in a name. It's very liquid. Um, it has all the fundamentals and all the technicals that I'm looking at, but it's not something that I'm going to do always, and I'm not going to um, want to um, do that with all names because I know that if the position size is too large, you know, sometimes you hear of traders, you know, putting on you know, 30, 40% position sizes, that may work for a little while, but over time, uh, that's a recipe to blow up an account. Kathy, we got a couple minutes left here. Just want to give the floor to you. Any lessons, difficult lessons you learned over the years? Uh, maybe put a smile on your face right now. <laughs> uh, well, definitely, uh, I'll, I'll reiterate uh, what I was talking about earlier about cutting losses. You know, the, the golden rule, as I mentioned from Bill O'Neill, is, is the 7% seven to 8% from your buy point. And as you mentioned, hers is even tighter than that. And, you know, that was a rule I broke starting out as a new investor. And I do remember, 
you know, having a stock that I held for like a 20% loss and part through our network, I had shared that and they're like, you know, they basically gave me intervention, (laughs) (laughs) you know, you need to cut that. And so, you know, the rules are there for a reason, you know, buying at the exact buy point so that you can hold on. And and one of the reasons there was another rule that I broke, you know, uh, not buying at the proper buy point that that Bill O'Neill would, would teach about in this book from the basis from uh, at the uh, cup and handle basis or, or whatever it happens to be. So the rules are there for a reason. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, we can write them down and we can say that we're going to follow them. And then you actually go out and trade and nothing beats experience then. So you have your rules and then you have your experience and your emotions and those together, you can figure out, you know, what kind of person you are and what works for you. And that was how I figured out for me that I wanted to be the long-term investor. And, um, you know, I wanted to hold on for the long haul. I would go to Bill O'Neill seminars and he'd have these charts and he'd show, you know, hundreds of percent gain. And I'm like, how are they doing that? And that's Mm -hmm. what I really honed in and focused in on was how were they doing it? And so I don't know if it was, you know, coincidence, kismet, you know, and then getting with Eve and the team and figuring out, oh, well, actually it's the institutional advance phase. That's the, that's the phase that I need to be in to get those gains that I used to see at the master seminar at, you know, Investors Business Daily. So uh, I just want to share that, you know, everyone's got what works for them. And if you, as long you just keep working at it and or what Bill wrote in my book, I wanted to say earlier, okay, Bill signed yes. in my book, he said, keep at it. So keep at it, find what works for you, and then just hone that skill, you know, what works best for you? What are you good at? And then there's nothing that I think can keep you from success. I, I think Bill's words have rubbed off on both of you, both of them in writing, by the way, in books that he wrote. Very interesting to think about that. Also want to mention one more time before we go, the life cycle trade. We've been talking about it a lot. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon, got some great customer reviews as well. And as we close, I'm going to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much, Kathy Donnelly and uh, Eve Boback here, both co-authors of the life cycle trade and Eve, portfolio manager over at Ropel, Ropel Capital Management, excuse me. Uh, really appreciate you being here and to everybody viewing. Appreciate you guys too here. And we're going to see you again in the near future.